All right, in this video, we're going to take a look at predicting intermolecular forces, which is useful for uh, preparation for the first web assignment in liquids and solids, or for review before a test or exam. The goal in this presentation will be to predict the intermolecular forces that exist between the particles of a solid substance when you're given the chemical formula. The different IMFs that we've considered include ion-ion forces, which exist in ionic compounds, the forces that hold the ionic compound together. Those are sometimes called electrostatic forces on this web assignment that we're going to do. If the, if the substance we're dealing with is molecular, then it may involve polar molecules, in which case there will be dipole-dipole forces. If, in addition to involving polar submolecules, those molecules have hydrogen atoms directly bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, then there will, in addition to dipole-dipole forces, there will be hydrogen bonding. Finally, if, if the substance we're dealing with is molecular, whether it's polar or nonpolar, it'll have London dispersion forces. You recall those are temporary instantaneous dipoles, dipole-dipole uh, forces that are created as a result of the asymmetric distribution of electrons around the, the atom or, or molecule. On our web assignment, those are sometimes called dispersion forces or just LD forces. As we go through these next few examples, we're basically going to follow a, a simple pattern. We're going to start by asking ourselves, is this substance we're looking at ionic or is it molecular? To answer that, we'll just use the original definitions of ionic and molecular substances. If it's ionic, it'll be made of a metal bonded to a non-metal or complex ions. If it's covalent, molecular, then it'll be made of just non-metal atoms and no complex ions. If we decide that it's an ionic compound, we'll conclude that therefore it has ion-ion forces holding it together and we're done. If we conclude that it's a molecular compound, then automatically we'll conclude it has London dispersion forces. All molecular compounds will have London dispersion forces. Next, we'll decide, is the compound polar or nonpolar? If it's nonpolar, then we're done. The only IMFs are London dispersion forces. But if it's a polar compound, then in addition to the LDFs, it would have dipole-dipole forces holding it together as well. And finally, if it had dipole-dipole forces, we would then check to see if there's the possibility of hydrogen bonding as a third IMF. So in other words, if a substance has hydrogen bonding, it must also have dipole-dipole forces, and it must also have London dispersion forces. As we go through the examples, I'd strongly recommend that you pause the video and then you try the questions yourself, then listen to the explanation. So the first example, we want to identify the most important types of IMFs that are present in carbon dioxide. So see if you can pause the video and, and, and go through that series of questions that I asked just a moment ago. So the first thing we'll notice is that it's made of carbon and oxygen, which are just non-metals. So that means carbon dioxide must be a molecular substance. It's not ionic. Since it's molecular, that means it must have London dispersion forces between the particles. The next question would be, is it a polar or nonpolar compound? To decide that can sometimes be problematic. Carbon dioxide is one that I asked you to memorize something about. I asked you to memorize the shape of the molecule. Carbon dioxide is a linear molecule made of carbon bonded, double bonded to two oxygen atoms like that. Knowing um, electronegativities, the top four, <laughs> excuse me, the top four elements for electronegativity are fluorine, followed by oxygen, nitrogen, and chlorine. I could predict just based on that, that the difference in electronegativity between carbon and oxygen is likely going to be 
on that of a polar bond. Now, if you want to double check the uh, the actual electronegativity table to verify that, go ahead. But I'm going to predict that the carbon oxygen bond is polar. And because oxygen is the greater electronegativity, there'll be a vector, an arrow pointing from carbon to oxygen. But there's another arrow, another vector, another dipole pointing from carbon to the other oxygen as well. And those are opposite and identical to each other, which means these two bonds, which are polar, actually cancel each other out. So the molecule turns out to be nonpolar. And we're done. Since it's nonpolar, the only IMF will be London dispersion forces. Okay, so the two bonds are polar, but the linear shape results in a nonpolar overall molecule. Okay, pause the video and try this one yourself. So we note right away that the KBr is made of a metal bonded to non-metal, which means it's an ionic compound, potassium bromide. If it's an ionic compound, it must be made of cations attracted to anions with ion-ion forces. And we're done. The only IMF that would be present in this compound is ion-ion forces. We've seen in the class a model of the sodium chloride crystal. Um, potassium bromide will have a similar shape. It's called a crystal lattice structure, um, a regular arrangement of potassium and bromide ions. And they're going to be held together in that crystal structure by strong attractive forces, electrostatic forces, between the positive and negative ions, according to Coulomb's law that we talked about in class. Right now, here's one where I didn't animate it for some reason. Um, you can try, you can verify this one with me, I guess. So we've got a molecule. It's clearly it's molecular because it's made of carbon, hydrogen. There's no metal, non-metal in here, so it's a covalent molecular compound. So automatically, that means it must have London dispersion forces holding the particles together. Next, we decide, is it a nonpolar or is it a polar compound? If there's only carbon and hydrogen in the molecule, we know from uh, our, our notes on the types of bonding that carbon-carbon bonds with zero difference of electronegativity and carbon-hydrogen bonds with very, very small differences of electronegativity are nonpolar bonds. Since all of the bonds in that molecule are nonpolar, the molecule is nonpolar, and therefore the only IMF is London dispersion forces. Now keep in mind that London dispersion forces are the weakest IMF. However, when molecules get larger or atoms get larger, the electron cloud around the particle is larger, and that means the particle will be more polarizable. It'll more easily form those instantaneous dipoles that, that uh, lead to London dispersion forces. So the London dispersion forces are, get stronger when molecules or atoms that are nonpolar get larger. So this molecule here has four carbons and ten hydrogens. Its London dispersion forces would be stronger than those, say, within methane. CH4, a smaller particle made up of carbon and hydrogen also. Okay, so pause the video and see if you can rationalize this one. Right, so did you conclude again that it is made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, so therefore it's a molecular compound? which means it must have London dispersion forces as an IMF. However, we notice this time that in addition to the nonpolar carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds that are throughout much of the molecule, there is this ending which has clearly an OH. The OH bond is polar, and that oxygen is actually attached to this carbon, 
So there's going to be a carbon-oxygen bond as well. So there's two bonds near the end of this molecule that are polar, and therefore, and they don't cancel each other out with, with their geometry. So therefore, with those two polar bonds at the end of the molecule, the molecule will be a polar molecule, and that means it's going to have dipole-dipole forces in addition to its London dispersion forces. However, we're not done. If we see that it has dipole-dipole forces, we should also check, does it have hydrogen bonding as well? Well, the fact that there's an OH, a hydrogen directly bonded to oxygen within the molecule, means that it does in fact have hydrogen bonding as well. So the H in this molecule would be attracted to the oxygen in another one of the molecules, and that attractive force is not only a dipole-dipole force, it's a hydrogen bond, which are very, very strong dipole-dipole forces. Now, if you asked me which of the IMFs within this compound were most was most important, contributed to the greatest extent to its intermolecular forces, I would have to say it's the hydrogen bonding. So the hydrogen bonding is the most important IMF. But if you asked me, as this question does, just to list all of the IMFs that are present, I'd have to say London dispersion forces because it was molecular, dipole-dipole forces because it's polar, and hydrogen bonding because the H, I see, is bonded directly to oxygen. All right, pause the video and try this guy as well. So here, we don't actually have a compound. We have just an element, and it's, it's xenon, just an atomic element. It's one of the noble gases. Because it's just a single atom, then we conclude it must be nonpolar. It's made of just nonpolar atoms. In our notes, when we discussed uh, London dispersion forces, we used helium atoms as an example. Xenon will just be a, another example of the same thing. So the IMFs are going to be London dispersion forces. Since it is not polar, we don't have to go any further. We're, we're done with London dispersion forces in this example. Now, if you compare xenon's London dispersion forces to those within helium, you'd have to say that xenon's forces are much larger because xenon is a much larger atom than helium. Xenon would be more polarizable, and therefore it'll have stronger IMFs. Another example, pause the video and try that yourself. This is our final example. So did you conclude that HCl is a molecular or covalent compound? Therefore, it has London dispersion forces. Next, we consider the HCl bond. Now you could look up the difference in electronegativity in your data booklet if you'd like to classify that bond, or you could use some logic. Um, the Cl is one of the top four electronegativities. Hydrogen is not that small of an electronegativity. It's around 2.1, if I recall, or 2.2, which means the difference between H and Cl is likely going to be medium. It's going to be not 1.7 or greater, which would make it an ionic bond. It's going to end up being um, a, co a polar covalent bond. Now, if you want to actually look up its difference of electronegativities to, to verify that, go for it. But I'm going to estimate that it is a um, polar covalent bond. Therefore, it has dipole-dipole forces as an IMF. One molecule of HCl will have a dipole towards the chlorine, so the chlorine is going to be partially negative. The hydrogen will be partially positive. That's because chlorine is the more electronegative element. It will be attracted to another HCl particle with dipole-dipole forces. Oops. <laughs> so the chlorine in one atom will be attracted to the hydrogen in a neighboring molecule. So the chlorine in one molecule will be attracted to the hydrogen in a neighboring molecule, and that attraction is the dipole-dipole force.
does it have hydrogen bonding? Well, we remember the requirement for hydrogen bonding is that you be molecular, that's good, that you be polar, that's good, and that you have hydrogen bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. In this case, we have hydrogen bonded to chlorine, which is not one of those three atoms, so there are, there's no hydrogen bonding in this, in this uh, compound. So we're done with London dispersion and dipole-dipole forces. So with that introduction, I hope that helps. You can uh, grab an iPad if you're in class and you can begin your uh, web assignment for liquids and solids on intermolecular forces, or, or this may hopefully have been a good review for a test or for exam. Good luck.